I'm going to turn it over to our speaker. And I was in the process of saying if everybody could silence their cell phone or turn it off so it would be least amount of disruption, that'll be great. Let's go for it. All right. Thank you for welcoming me here. I'm looking forward to speaking to you all for a Can you hear me okay? I'm going to speak up. Okay, I'll speak up. So Dr. Hay, I think initially was supposed to be here, but I'm happy to be here with you all today. So let me know if I need to speak up after this. We had some tough technical difficulties, but it looks like we're ready to get started. Can you speak up, please? I can speak up a little bit more. Thank you. Okay. So we're going to talk about COPD and idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So I know some of you have COPD, some of you may have pulmonary fibrosis. There are lots of different causes of pulmonary fibrosis, but today we're going to talk specifically about idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And that's the type of fibrosis where we really don't know what the cause is. So we'll talk about some basics of the two disease processes, and we're going to talk briefly about the symptoms, how they may present. There is some overlap with the symptoms of COPD and idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, but there are some differences as well. So we'll get into, get into those. Then we're gonna talk about some how we diagnose COPD versus how we diagnose IPF. And then we're gonna talk about the different treatments for the two diseases, okay? Everybody hear me okay now? Is that better? Yeah. All right, so. All right, so we're going to start with COPD. So COPD is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So this really is an umbrella term that covers a few different disease processes from chronic bronchitis, where you may have a frequent respiratory infections characterized by a productive cough, as well as emphysema. So emphysema is a disease process where you have very abnormal airways. Chronic bronchitis, you have abnormal airways, but in a different way. So in chronic bronchitis, you typically have increased mucus production. With emphysema, you have very abnormal airways at the uh, distal airspaces, the small airways, the alveoli. So those don't function normally. They lose that elastic recoil that normal people use to clear secretions, cough, exhale. You don't have that in emphysema. So that leads to a lot of different symptoms like shortness of breath, wheezing, and increased call with mucus production. So we'll talk more about that. COPD is characterized by airflow limitation, or what we call obstruction, on your pulmonary function test. So I assume most of you have had pulmonary function tests, and I know most of you probably don't like to do those tests. <laughs> Nobody likes those tests, but they're really very helpful for us to determine your prognosis how severe your lung disease is, and it helps us with treatment as well. So it's very important for us, it's very helpful to know, I know painful for you to go through. Again, this is characterized by, COPD characterized by chronic inflammation, overgrowth of mucus glands, and then more so with emphysema as the narrowing loss or dysfunction of those small airways. So this leads to productive cough, shortness of breath, wheezing, difficulty clearing those secretions, and increased risk of respiratory infections. So as I'm sure you, most of you know, smoking is probably the most important risk factor for COPD. And it's one of the big things that we can potentially control. So that's, that's one of the foundations of treatment. We always wanna to try to get you to stop smoking. If you continue to smoke, your lung function will decline at a more rapid rate. And smoking in and of itself can cause irritation, inflammation, airway, and cause more symptoms in the short term. However, COPD can be caused by other things. It can be caused by pollution. It can be caused by occupational exposures, biomass. So not so much in this country, but in, in other countries, if, if people are cooking in areas that are poorly ventilated or have heating areas that are poorly ventilated, they can potentially be at risk for developing COPD over a period of so those are other risks as well. And then it can potentially be genetic. I'm sure most of you who do have COPD, COPD probably had genetic testing at some point. The alpha-1 antitrypsin level was probably checked at some point. So that uh, can cause, the alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency can actually cause the development of COPD in patients who are not smoked. 
<clears throat> and if you do have a deficiency, you may qualify for treatment with, with infusion or supplementation of that level if, if you qualify based on your lung function and, and the level. And women actually appear to be more susceptible to developing COPD than men. Um, with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, it appears to be more common in men. So that's, that's one difference there. Mm -hmm. Why is that? I don't know. That's Very a interesting fact. That's a good question. I don't, I don't have an answer for that. All right. <coughs> Move to symptoms. So there can actually be a lot of overlap between the symptoms of COPD and idiopathic, or the presentation of COPD and idiopathic fibrosis, pulmonary fibrosis. One of the big, most important presenting symptoms is shortness of breath. So shortness of breath may present with significant physical activity that may progress over time to the point where you're short of breath with minimal exertion. You can even be short of breath at rest as the disease progresses. Another presenting symptom is often cough, as I'm sure you all are aware who have COPD. The cough is typically productive, that's the classic presentation, and it's usually worse in the morning, but that's not always the case. Some people don't have a productive cough, some people have a cough that's pretty significant throughout the day, so. But classically, it's a productive cough that's worse in the morning. You may have wheezing, chest tightness, this can also occur with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. A lot of patients will complain of decreased energy or lack of energy, <coughs> and this typically tends to progress over the course of the disease process. So as the symptoms get worse, as the disease progresses, this symptom may get worse and you have more fatigue throughout the day. That is also seen in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So frequent respiratory infections, as I alluded to earlier, those airways aren't functioning normally, so that makes you more susceptible to getting infections. Um, it's more difficult to clear secretions. So if someone presents to our office with shortness of breath and they tell us they have frequent bronchitis, um, several episodes a year, they're a smoker, all of those things, we would certainly think about COPD. Unintentional weight loss is another potential symptom. So this usually occurs later in later stages of the disease as the disease progresses. Um, patients may have unintentional weight loss. And something else that we think about with weight loss is potential cancer, lung cancer. So it can also present with weight loss and smoking would certainly be a risk factor for that. All right. So now we're gonna move on to diagnosis. So as I already alluded to, we look at your symptoms. So shortness of breath, recurrent infections, repeated bronchitis, uh, productive cough, all of those things. Uh, risk factors, so as I mentioned before, the smoking, that's a big risk factor. So if we have a patient who comes in, they've smoked a pack a day for 10 years or 20 years and they're having shortness of breath, recurrent respiratory infections, then we would think about COPD. But we actually need more information to diagnose COPD. One of the, one of the parts of the diagnosis would be imaging. So, chest x-ray, chest CT, so let's see if I can use this. I know you don't look at chest x-rays or CT scans regularly, I assume you don't. So I just, I think it's helpful to actually see here the difference. So this is a normal chest x-ray, and then to the right here we have an example of someone with COPD. So as you can see here we have all these, so this is your left lung, this is your right lung, this is your heart border, and this is your diaphragm. So you have your nice crisp borders, rounded diaphragm. Here with COPD, you have this, what we call in hyperinflation. So we see all these lung spaces, rib spaces, and then we see these flattening of the diaphragm. And that's characteristic, that's due to hyperinflation. It's difficult to completely exhale that air that you've inhaled. So here's the, shows you where the diaphragm is flattened, and then where a normal patient with normal lung function would typically have a diaphragm. This is a CT scan. I think this is very helpful to look at as well. So the CT scan, this is, is if any of you have had a CT scan, this is as if you're flat on the CT scan. This is your left lung, this is your right lung. And you see these areas in gray. Uh, this is relatively normal lung. And then you see all this area in black that almost looks like holes in the lung. And here, 
And this is, these are all areas of emphysema. So you have a large area of non-functioning lung, which you can understand why you might have shortness of breath. And in these non-functioning areas of lung make it difficult for the clearing secretions that you get. Also, probably the most important thing in diagnosing CFD is your pulmonary function tests again. So again, even though it's painful to you, it is very important and helpful for us. So again, what we see is this obstructive pattern, and I know you don't look at what we call flow volume move from your lung function test, but this is a normal patient with expiratory flow and inspiratory flow. And this is a patient here in blue with COPD, so this is obstruction. We look at this FEV1, that's how much you can exhale in one second, and you see it's very, very much slower in a patient with COPD, so it just takes you a longer time to completely exhale. All right, so let's move on to treatment. <coughs> so we talked about some of this already, but the most important thing is to stop smoking if you're a smoker. So as we get older, as we all get older, our lung function will decline over time. If you continue to smoke, your lung function is gonna decline at a faster rate. So once you stop smoking, that kind of damage is done, but then your decline over time is gonna slow to that as a non-smoker, the rate is gonna slow. Inhaled medications, I'm sure many of you are familiar with inhaled medications. So if you're not having a lot of symptoms and your lung function is not, as a, lung, lung dysfunction is not as advanced, we may actually put you on what's called a short-acting longer dilator or albirol. So if you're not having a lot of symptoms, you can use albirol as needed. If that's not working to control your symptoms or you have more severe symptoms of presentation, we might actually put you on this anticholinergic medication and that's kind of our baseline treatment. That's something like Spiriva, if anybody's on Spiriva or um, Improves or Divorza. That helps to dry up the mucus, open up those airways, we may actually put you on a combination medication like, uh, I don't know if any of you are on a Noro or Stealto that has that anticholinergic medication plus a long-acting form of that albuterol. So that helps to control your symptoms a little bit better. And if you're still not well controlled or you pre present with more severe symptoms, we may actually put you on what's called a triple therapy inhaler like Trelogy. So I've seen some of you may be on Trelogy or Bread Street. And that has the same medications in it, plus an inhaled steroid. So the triple therapy, or sometimes even the, the dual therapy uh, medications have been shown to potentially improve your lung function uh, if you use it regularly, and potentially reduce the risk of your attacks. So these inhaled medications are kind of our cornerstone treatment and do oftentimes help symptoms and may potentially improve your lung function. If you're having frequent attacks, or if you're having at least two attacks a year, or one attack that requires hospitalization, we may actually put you on azithromycin, <coughs> chronic azithromycin, three times a week, and that's more for its anti-inflammatory effects rather than the antibiotic effects. Um, <clears throat> another medication is Dalaref, that's a daily medication. So those two medications have been shown to potentially reduce the frequency of your attacks. And, um, as I'm sure if you've gotten bronchitis, you're aware that when you have an attack or an exacerbation that we call it, we put you on antibiotics and steroids. Occasionally, we will put you on chronic, chronic prednisone. That's usually we like to try to avoid that, as I'm sure you're aware, chronic prednisone can have side effects, a lot of side effects. So we like to usually avoid that, but sometimes we do use it in some patients, and it does tend to help symptoms. But again, that's more of a last resort medication because studies have not really shown that it improves mortality. Oxygen is another treatment for COPD. Uh, usually you have to have to hit that magic number of 88%. So you have to be at 88% to qualify for oxygen. And that's, that level has been shown to uh, result in the most benefit with use of oxygen. Some patients may drop to 88% when they're exercising, um, and we do use that in that situation for more symptomatic Pulmonary rehab is a very important part of treatment. I don't know how many of you have participated in pulmonary rehab, but that has actually been shown to improve your symptoms, your quality of life, your exercise tolerance, may potentially reduce the frequency of your attacks. Uh, there are very, some very good programs in this area, so that is something that we usually recommend as part of treatment for moderate to severe COPD. Another important part of treatment is uh, to, to be up to date on your vaccine. So we want to make sure, we want to minimize your risk of infection. Anytime you get 
<laughs> infection, that may reduce your lung function over time. So current infections, you may not get back to where you were before that infection. So you really want to reduce your risk of getting bacterial infection, viral infection. So with COPD, you want to make sure you're up to date on your flu shot, your uh, COVID shots, your boosters, um, pneumonia shot. Even if you're less than 65, you should get your pneumonia shot. So vaccines are very important for prevention. <coughs> In, uh, there is another component of treatment that we call in-home non-invasive ventilation therapy, and that's just basically similar to BiPAP, but we can kind of titrate different components of treatment for that. And that's the mask with the pressure. If you qualify for that, you have to have an elevated carbon dioxide level that tells us you're not ventilating as well as you should. So that's also an important part of treatment for patients that qualify for that. Surgery is also an option, and that's particularly if you have those areas where there's poor lung function more in the upper parts of the lungs, like, so if you have severe emphysema in the upper parts of the lungs, or what we call gola, which actually kind of large holes in the lung that are in the upper part of the lung, then you could potentially have surgery to remove those areas if you qualify so that the good lung can kind of re-expand and, and fill those spaces. Um, and something similar to that that is a less invasive is um, endobronchial valves, and there's just a picture of this here. So we do this with a bronchoscope. This is more advanced procedure. We do this at VCU. So they actually put valves in the airway with a bronchoscope. They're one-way valves, and they actually cause the area that's past this point to collapse. So that non-functioning lung, that really empidemonous lung that's really not working for you, causes it to collapse. So no air will go into the, those airways. And however, it's one way, so air can come out or mucus can come out of those areas. And then lung transplantation is another option. So that, that requires certain qualifications as far as your lung function, um, <coughs> age requirements, weight requirements, and then that comes with its own sort of issues with immunosuppression. Okay. All right, now we're going to move on to IPF. So IPF, again, is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And as I mentioned earlier, it seems to be more common with advancing age, more common in men. Uh, we really don't see this earlier than age 50, so more common with, with older patients. Potential risk factors. Um, so we, with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, again, the, the name idiopathic just means we don't know what it is. There are, there are a number of different causes of pulmonary fibrosis in general medications, rheumatologic diseases, um, exposures, but for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, we really don't know what it is. There are some potential risk factors. Um, patients tend to be smokers, their potential exposure to stone, metal, wood dust, air pollutants, potentially acid reflux. So there's no clear association there, but potentially there is some component of acid reflux contributing to this presentation. So we do try to treat acid reflux pretty aggressively in these patients. Idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is likely caused by cycles of cell injury and dysregulated repair leading to progression of the scarring of fibrosis. So the overall prognosis typically is, is, is not very good for IPF. The median survival range is about two to five years. However, there seems to be a lot of variability with that. Um, 20 to 25 percent may actually live longer than 10 years. All right, so diagnosis. Oops, sorry. So, okay, so before we get to diagnosis, <coughs> signs and symptoms. So, <coughs> so similar, similarly to the COPD, you can have shortness of breath. And shortness of breath also tends to progress as the disease progresses. So you may only have shortness of breath when you're really exerting yourself initially, as the disease progresses, that can get worse to either get short breath with your, what we call activities of daily living, getting up, getting dressed, preparing meals, um, and it may progress to where you're short of breath at rest all the time. These patients often have a cough, and then classically it's a dry cough. So again, with COPD, typically or classically, it's a productive cough. So there can be a variability here, but classically it's a dry cough. These patients may have fatigue, like with COPD, fatigue, decreased energy throughout the day, and, and this may progress as the disease progresses. Patients may have clubbing, and this is just an example of clubbing, as you can see the nails here. Uh, and that's not specific to IPF, that can occur in other lung diseases as well. 
these patients may have unintentional weight loss, you know, just like with COPD. And again, it's usually in the later stages as the disease progresses. And something that's a little bit different from COPD is that these patients may have muscle and joint pain. That's not typical for, for COPD. But again, we need really more information to diagnose it than just symptoms. Okay, so diagnosis. And as I alluded to earlier, we have to exclude <coughs> other possible calls. Do you have a question? Yeah, what is clubbing? Clubbing? So clubbing is just, I'm just gonna go back to the emails. It, it's this finding here on the nails. You <coughs> oh. see that kind of rounded nails? And that's just due to low oxygen. And that can happen in a number of lung diseases. <coughs> All right, so like I said, we need more information to make the diagnosis. So we need to exclude poor hygiene. We need to exclude other possible causes of pulmonary fibrosis. So as I uh, mentioned earlier, pulmonary fibrosis can be caused by several different types of rheumatologic diseases. It can be caused by rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, Sjogren's syndrome, lots of other diseases can cause pulmonary fibrosis. So we usually check, check, check lab work for those diseases and get a full history. Medications can potentially cause fibrosis. Uh, one common cause is amiodarone, so you, some of you may be on amiodarone. That can potentially cause changes like this. Can you speak up, please? I can, yeah. Can you so, repeat what you just said? Yes, so there are medications that can cause fibrosis as well, and one relatively common cause is amiodarone. So amiodarone can cause changes like this in the lungs, that's possible and exposures as well. So different exposures, sometimes we'll actually do lab work to see if you have <coughs> exposures to common or potential triggers in the environment. Although those blood tests are not always that helpful. So it's very important to take a very thorough history, do a thorough physical exam, and do other blood work lab tests to exclude other potential causes. The chest X-ray, or more importantly, the CT scan is very helpful in the diagnosis of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So, as you can see here, it's another CT scan. So this is your, you know, any of you, again, if you've ever had a CT scan, this is as if you were lying flat in the scanner. This is your left lung, this is your right lung, this is your heart border here. So as you can see here, there's lots of little holes here, what we call honeycombing. So this is the fibrosis here. And then as you can see here, so classically with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, it's typically in the periphery of the lung. So you can see here it's peripheral scarring and then here as well. And typically it starts out more prominent, so it's in the periphery and more prominent in the basis of your lung. So these are the bases here. So it's pretty significant here and then you can see it on the periphery here. And oftentimes in the process of this disease, you can have worsening of fibrosis so it's more diffuse over time. And that can lead to worsening shortness of breath, increased oxygen requirement, all of those things. On your pulmonary function test, uh, instead of an obstructive pattern like you would see in COPD, you actually see a restrictive pattern. So that just means it's difficult to completely get this air in. So difficult to get this air in because the lungs aren't functioning normally, they're very stiff and fibrotic, they're scarred. Checking oxygenation is very important. So while we do a walking test, a, like a regular exercise test, or we'll do a six minute walking test, and this is very helpful to compare the lung function, your oxygenation, how you're doing over a period of time. So the breathing test, we usually monitor over a period of several months. We may repeat your walking test or your six-minute walking test every three to six months or so. With uh, the improvement in our CT scanners over the last years, yeah, oftentimes we don't need to do a biopsy. We're able to see a clear pattern on CT scan. So if we're able to we get the appropriate history, we can exclude other causes. And we have this classic pattern on the CT scan, that's enough to make the diagnosis. A lot of times we don't need to proceed to the biopsy. All right, so we're gonna talk about uh, treatment here briefly. So <coughs> there aren't a lot of options with, uh, with treatment for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis at this point. So there are a couple of medications. Uh, one is Esprit, one is Otha. These medications have been shown to potentially slow the progression of the fibrosis over time. So if you're coming in with a new diagnosis of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, we will likely talk to you about these medications. Some of you may be on these medications. 
Uh, they can have side effects. If any of you are all men, I'm sure you're aware, they can cause uh, gastrointestinal side effects, they can cause abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting. Um, they can potentially, um, they can cause sensitivity to light and sun. So we usually start on the low dose and then slowly titrate the dose. If you have difficulty tolerating it, we will maybe decrease the dose and then try again. So these medications that show some promise but do have potential side effects, but they're the, the best treatment that we have as of now. Again, as I mentioned earlier, we do try to aggressively treat acid reflux because there may be some association um, with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. As with advanced, more advanced COPD, we do recommend supplemental oxygen if you have an oxygen uh, level of 88% or below. And then pulmonary rehab is also recommended and helpful. As with uh, COPD, we do recommend that you're up to date on your vaccines. Um, so if you have an uh, in infection, that lung function could get worse. You can typically get much sicker than somebody that's got normal lung function when you get one of these infections. So again, we want you to have your flu shot, your COVID vaccines, um, your pneumonia shot. Even if you're less than 65, you should have all the data. You should be up to date on all those vaccines. Do you, so, do you recommend the RSV vaccine as well? I do, yes, for everybody under 60. Yes, that's, I should have said that before, but yes, um, RSV as well. We certainly want, want you to get a bad virus. Um, <clears throat> and then similarly, uh, compared to COPD, if you have an attack or an exacerbation, sometimes that can be related to an infection or progression of the disease. So we do want you to have antibiotics and steroids for that. And then the other potential treatment option, like with advanced COPD, would be lung transplant. And then that comes with all the other issues with lung transplant. You're gonna be on immunosuppressive medications that could potentially put you at risk for infections and can have side effects with that as well. So th those would be the options for treatment with, with there's, there's no inhalers that are use, effective and useful in uh, I, yeah, no. yeah, I mean, sometimes we do put patients on inhalers and nebulized medications, but they really haven't been shown to be effective. So that's all I have. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> on the inoculation, is there a problem getting all three of them in the same day? Could you repeat that yes. question so that people yes. both can hear? So she asked about the vaccines. Is it is it okay to get all three in the same day? Uh, the recommendation is that you can get multiple vaccines in a day. I probably would wait and, and maybe do two at a time and then wait a couple weeks and do the other one um, rather than doing all three at once in case you have some reaction. Um, but it's probably safe. I, I would usually recommend doing two and then wait. Yes. Talk about the difference between the OFAD and SPM. I was on OFAD. Mm -hmm. And then they switched me over to SPM. And could you talk a little bit about how you determine which one is better and why would it change? They actually work pretty similarly. So we will typically, there's no, there are not a lot of studies that show one is significantly superior to the other. So it, it depends on some may start with one, some may start with the other. If you have a lot of side effects with one, then we would try to switch to the other and see how you do the other. Did they said it had something to do with it? Elders, which I, I don't completely understand. And my understanding is that we're pretty similar. Okay. Do you have a question? Now, you mentioned the drug amiodarone mm -hmm. uh, in relation to the contraindication causing some of the symptoms I believe with COPD. Was it uh, uh, so amiodarone can cause a lot of side effects in the lung. What is it used for is what I wonder. Who would be taking it? Oh, amiodarone? Yeah. Uh, if you have heart dysfunction, mm -hmm. if you like atrial fibrillation, a lot of people have atrial fibrillation. You may be on a but people who are on that should be careful of the yeah, fibrillation. Well, yeah, I mean, and, and cardiologists are very aware of that. So they yeah. will usually check lung function. And oftentimes they don't want to have you on for a long time. So they will switch it somewhere else. Um, would you talk a little bit about long COVID and COPD? So again, we don't we don't have a lot of information on COVID because it's been only been like two or three years. So from what we typically see is some patients may have some underlying lung disease like COPD or asthma, you might not have significant symptoms, but then you get COVID and those symptoms seem to worsen. And that's kind of the pattern that we see is sometimes progression of your underlying lung disease, so you may need more treatment, you may need more aggressive treatment, and it can cause a lot of different uh, issues. It can 
cause worse than coughing, wheezing, shortness of breath, it can cause potentially scarring in the lungs. Um, so there are a lot of things that, um, that, that long COVID can cause, and typically we're more aggressive with our, our treatment of the underlying lung disease, and usually most patients respond to that. What studies in the area do you know of on long COVID and respiratory disease? Uh, I believe there are some studies at DCU. How would one find those methods? Um, I can certainly look into it and, and get information back to this group if you would like that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Who, I don't know who was next one today. Okay. I was interested in the, the uh, exposure to wood, metal. I don't understand. I've never heard that before. Yeah, it's, it's <coughs> not, it, these are potential risks. We, we really don't know. We really don't know what causes the effect. So we need to not be exposed to anything. Anything that can be a bullseye. It's really hard. To, it's really hard to say. Give it a tent. A any sort of exposure like that could potentially. We don't know. You know we just don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm a little baffled by your, your statement saying that you know we're really staying away from prednisone mm -hmm. these days. The only reason I'm saying that is. Uh, both my mother and my father-in-law had end-stage COPD mm -hmm. for years, and I swear that's what kept them going. It, and it, we couldn't taper them down beyond like 15 milligrams a day, or they would turn immediately into an exacerbation. Yeah, so I, I mean, there are, there are a group of people that we do use that because <clears throat> they don't respond to anything else for whatever reason. Okay. So it definitely can help your symptoms. It definitely may improve your energy. Um, but it just doesn't show a mortality benefit, and that's why we don't routinely recommend it. But yeah, there's certainly a, a definitely a population that does benefit. No, I just thought maybe some breakthrough had happened over the past number of years, and they stopped doing. No, I mean it's just sometimes we just have to do things. Yeah. I mean, as I'm sure you know, I have I have side effects all the time. Oh sure. So I uh, I you know, personally don't like to do them unless we don't have any other options. Okay. Um, so. Uh, but uh, like I said, we do have some patients, we've tried everything, they're still having a lot of symptoms, and yes, that would be a good patient we would put on a low dose of okay. Yes, so that's definitely. Thank you. You're down in pulmonary associates, and there are a lot of pulmonologists down there. Mm -hmm. And I assume they consolidate, we call operational expenses, mm -hmm. and makes it worthwhile to do together. Do they ever collaborate on diagnoses and treatment? Yes. Or does everybody just operate individually? No, no, we, I mean, if there's something we have a question about, I think we're very good about talking to each other. And there are actually, there's a combined meeting every two weeks, uh, like a chest conference or a tumor conference. Mm -hmm. um, if we have challenging cases, we actually present it in a meeting where there's a pulmonologist, there's an oncologist, there's a surgeon, there's a radiologist, so we do, yes. So particular cases that, that not every patient or case is straightforward, does not fit the <coughs> textbook, as they say. So, yes, yeah, so if there's a question, I think we're, we're very good about collaborating. Are they doing any studies now? We're doing a limited amount of studies. Um, we had done more research uh, in the past, but we're just doing a limited amount of studies at this point. More so, like in pulmonary hypertension, we have one doctor who just does pulmonary hypertension. Mm -hmm. Did your chart describe any of the causes that I did? Uh, listed was something like damage to cells. It may not be, it may not have used the word damage, but the lesson that the effectiveness of cells mm -hmm. as a cause. The reason I'm asking is just to address an ongoing uh, problem. Yeah, I mean, I think the assumption is. Could you repeat that? Because we couldn't hear it. Yes, yeah, so he was just asking about when we were talking about possible causes cell, of cell injury. That's the third, yes. The and, fourth, third, third uh, point there. Right, so I think we're saying, you know, likely caused by. We really don't know, again, what, what causes idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, but we assume that this is a cell injury, continued cell injury, and dysregulated care that just progresses over time. That's why you have the progression of the lung disease. The worst uh, the scar. The of a cell either dies or, or lives. Does it continue in the injury, injury state? It, it can potentially. Okay. Do you have another question? Um, I 
have two questions. One is the Chinese vaccine are making worse for idea. Has what vaccine? Any vaccine? Okay. All the yes, baby, baby. That would that would be very, 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 very unlikely. Mm -hmm. I think that the benefits would very strongly out. The benefits of you having protection against a, a bacterial infection or a viral infection would greatly, greatly outweigh any potential side effects. And second question is uh, can the um, the pulmonary rehab help in the country? Can pulmonary rehab help? Um, yeah, yes. yes. In IPO? Mm -hmm. So I think it, in, as far as your symptoms go, I think it can help symptoms, it can help quality of life, it can definitely improve your exercise tolerance. As far as preventing progression, it's probably not going to do that, but I think it would help you feel better. Thanks. Do you offer pulmonary rehab in the area, and do you recommend either or the other? So, I, I mean, I have not gone personally and participated in the rehab to, just to be clear about that. I have gotten the best feedback from Chip and Ham Pulmonary Rehab Program. I have gotten yeah, a lot of good feedback. So I, I think that's probably the best program. Select Physical Therapy, I don't know if you've heard of that group. They have a number of different locations in the Richmond area. I work at the Bowlers location and occasionally will go to the Colonial Heights location, so I know uh, in that location that's all we have down there, select, mm -hmm. and we get good, good feedback from, from that group. But probably the best, most glowing uh, reports come from different uh, What is the natural progression of IPS? What might be your You have IPS? I'm not going to know. So what, what we typically see is this progression of scarring, so kind of and I don't know anything about your history, but classically it starts out that there's the scarring in the peri periphery and more or worse invasives and slowly progresses to involve more of the lung. And again, the medians, median survival, as I have up here, is about two to five years. So that sounds pretty grim, but uh, there's a lot of variability, variability as I've mentioned. Um, uh, you know, up to a quarter of patients may survive greater than 10 years. Um, but typically, or I should say, Classically, it's progression over time, worsening shortness of breath, increased oxygen requirement, worsening fall, those sorts of things. I have had patients who progress quickly. I've had patients who have been stable for years and haven't had any progression of symptoms or progression of symptoms again or anything. But what does, what am I going to be experiencing during this? As it gets worse? Well, well like I said, the, as, as that quadrosis as the scarring gets worse and involves more of your lung, then your shortness of breath is just going to get progressive, progressively worse. The cough may get worse. It may become initially dry and may become more productive. Your oxygen requirement will go up. The oxygenation will likely get worse as the, as the scarring gets worse. But again, there's variability with that. Sometimes it, it happens in a few years. Sometimes it takes years, over 10 years. It depends on the person. I'm just curious. Um, I knew the founder of this group, mm -hmm. Russell Glover, and he had idiopathic type pulmonary fibrosis. He had to go to Innova Hospital in Northern Virginia mm -hmm. for his transplant. Mm -hmm. Do they do them here in Richmond now? Mm -hmm. No. So, so your options would be, uh, <clears throat> and I think UVA was doing it for a lot. Unfortunately, there are not a lot of great options that are close by. So it would be Innova or, or Duke. Those are the two okay. places that I would recommend. UVA is still going for us. I've been going for last year to be put on the transplant. You have? Okay, because we haven't seen a lot of transplants from them. It's been kind of in and out of function. Along those lines, is there a percentage of your patients, PAR patients, that go for transplant? A percentage? Um, you know, do you have people saying, hey, I want a transplant? Oh, yeah. We, okay. We, we get them in. Usually I do either a NOVA or Duke, because even if UVA is doing them, they don't do a lot for us. So I, I typically do uh, NOVA or Duke because they have more volume. Is, is uh, VCU, do you think they are moving in that direction or not? We had heard that, but I haven't seen any, yeah, I knew that they any have action. Them. But, but a NOVA and Duke are very well established and um, we're able to usually get you in pretty quickly to have an evaluation. Is there a reason that VCU or 
I think they had a transplant sur surge. I mean, they, I think they're working on. They just have to get the numbers. They have to get the experience. So there's just not enough demand for it and surgeons for it. I, I think the the surgeon. I don't even know if they have one actually right now. But the, there's not enough experience. They have not had enough experience. Oh, okay. I have a question about um, support groups. Mm -hmm. um, in my experience in working with the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation, there's a there's a number of support groups that are connected to hospitals or you know have a more close connection to the medical community. And I, I think we've been a little frustrated here in Dark Matters that to try to establish a closer relationship because of the benefits of a support group to your maybe not not so much to your physical well being but certainly to your mental well being. And um, I just like to put in a plug for CAR doctors to um, encourage people to, to be involved in this. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely keep that in mind. I know I definitely will keep it in mind. I think that's one good thing about pulmonary rehab, too. You get not only sure. the benefit of the exercising <coughs> and the strength training and all that, but the support with the other patients they have. And some gyms, I know, even have programs that are kind of similar to pulmonary um, Rehab. I know after I finished at pulmonary rehab, my uh, the gym I was in was kind of helping to follow up to do the kind of training that we had before. So keeping it is really important. That's very important. But yeah, we'll, we'll definitely keep that in mind. Do you have a question? A little bit more about um, the transplant. I understand that Duke University, uh, someone told me recently, will take people who are even as old as 78. Yeah, potentially. And, and they, what used to be, you know, you got a certain age and you couldn't get a transplant. Mm -hmm. But I indirectly know somebody who did do that. Yeah, it, it depends. It's kind of a case-by-case -case basis. And usually particular cutoffs for age and lung function, obesity, weight, all of those things. But if there's somebody that we think would be a good candidate, we certainly would. Otherwise, we would get them in. We can certainly get them in for a consultation. My age is showing. I used to work as a social worker on a lung transplant program at the VA. Oh, okay. Connected with MCV, but they were doing some kind of surgical procedure that I never hear about from not working anymore. But it wasn't a transplant. It was just like an elbow <coughs> that they used to do a heart transplant. They had this thing for lungs that they did, and I can't think of the name of the surgery. You know what I'm talking about? Was it similar to that lung volume reduction surgery that I was, that we like kind of removed the, the back probably, lung? Yeah, it probably depends on what's wrong with your lung, but it's weird. Because <coughs> they've been doing that for a while. Uh -huh. It had a name that was out in the I can't think of anything but the lung volume. Anybody have any other questions? So, what would qualify for the transplant? What was that? What would qualify for the transplant? What would qualify for the tra transplant? So. You have to have lung, it's different for us sometimes for different institutions. So typically above 70, they don't like to transplant patients above 70. You have to have a particular lung function, so that value, that FEV1 value is in the back, or the FEC value in the, if it's pulmonary fibrosis. You can't be smoking, so you have to stop smoking for several months. A lot of uh, programs want, to, want you to have a good support system because it's, that's going to be very important um, over the course of the transplant. Is there a relationship between <coughs> um, lung disease and atrial fibrillation? I know several people who've developed atrial after they've been diagnosed with lung Yes, yes, there, there is a significant association with also different types of lung disease, um, <coughs> sleep apnea, all of those things could potentially trigger atrial fibrillation. You mentioned causes of COPD. <coughs> is persistent asthma over many years? Potentially, a potentially, yes. So we're seeing more, more data on that. Um, and then we're seeing some patients that don't technically meet criteria for COPD based on their lung function, um, but in some parts of the lung function. So we, there's a ratio that we look at, and then there's the value that how much you can see on the one cycle, that FEV1. So if that's below a certain level, but you don't technically qualify for COPD, we found recently in the last year, several years or so, that, that those patients can be at increased risk for having CPD. So there are a number of, number of things from the potential causes. The secondhand smoke one? 
I was not a smoker, but yeah. my mother smoked. I mean, we've certainly seen lots of patients develop COPD. They have no smoking themselves, but parents were heavy smokers growing up, or spouse was heavy smoker growing up. Okay. So, but we definitely see that. Any other questions? I have one more. Are you seeing an increase in the diagnosis of pulmonary fibrosis? I seem to, over the past couple of years, have come in contact. Aside from this group, I think we've had a lot of new people coming in here that have pulmonary fibrosis. <coughs> and I just know it just seems to be on the rise. I, I think that is the trend. I mean, I personally haven't seen a, an increase. Um, but that is the trend. There seem to be more cases. Not only so, I think that's because our CT scanners are getting better. Um, people are more aware and they're presenting earlier, um, more frequently. Mm -hmm. There's probably a number of reasons for okay. that. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Question. Is there any way that we could help you promote us? Um, I will make it more aware because I actually, to be honest with you, wasn't that aware of this group and I have been thinking about support groups uh, for my patients. So I will definitely make um, my group more aware of this. And if we can help you, I mean, if we can provide anything for you, we, we would gladly do that. Okay. Yeah, if you have, can you send me like a. Got them right here. An informational email, and I'll forward that to my. An informational email that you can forward to people. That would work. Okay. So I think what I hear is is a combination, possibly of cards slash brochures that she can individually give if a patient needs it and asks for it or whatever, or she gives it to them, and or monthly communication, electronic communication of the upcoming meetings. So she can share that as well. Or, you know, something we used to do, don't know if it's still a good fit, we used to be able to send an electronic flyer about the meeting and entities would post them in the office. So whatever guidance you give us, we'll be happy to, whatever strategic partnership that we can create would be awesome. Yeah, if you have some handouts, I will take them and so we could send it directly to you. Mm -hmm. yep. I think we could do that. Yes. I would point out there's a nice banner right down in the corner of the pulmonary associates lobby area. Well, we have started. Thanks to Joan Stoller. We have started putting the signs back up. My husband and I put one up at um, pulmonary associates on Broad Street. Oh, okay. um, it's <coughs> It's up there, it's still there because I went to get my shot the other last week and it was still in the same spot where we left it. And it's positioned right when the patients come out of um, seeing, the, seeing the physicians. It's it's out there. And then I mean, put one up in the folder's office. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Very nice. Um, so that's one thing that we're doing. But we also have business cards. <coughs> I was going to ask at the office, is there anywhere we could put them that people could, could take them as well? that has phone number, I think, and email on it, yeah. So, um, <coughs> we have new business cards um, printed um, with up-to-date information on it, so that was something that, um, you know, doctors could easily hand one of these to a patient because you have the people that we need to get yeah, that, would be, that would be great. <coughs> I know, I talked to my doctor the last time. I go to Dr. Jury at Broad Street. Oh, um, I talked to her about it when I was there. Yeah, and the office manager, oh, and she was the one that let me put the sign back up. Um, but she can only do that office. And I think I mean spoke with the one at Holt, and it was her friend. She gave her permission to put the sign back up at Holt. So I will definitely um, send an email to somebody. Can I give you something? Yeah, yeah. Very precious, not only to the people that you individually help, but as an educator to the public. Thank you for your time to share with us. We appreciate you.